And I'm going to say just a few words to begin with uh, about Tom Sargent, who of course is a leading figure in the foundation of justice uh, in 1957. He was Justice's secretary, um, <clears throat> since known as the Director of Justice. And actually soon that title, you'll notice, will change uh, to Chief Executive. Uh, we've appointed a new Chief Executive of Justice, uh, and she, I can tell you it is she, um, will be joining Justice as the Chief Executive uh, in the new year on a date to be announced. And I'll be able to tell you her name uh, in the very near future, but I'm afraid not tonight because we haven't quite finished the process of going through uh, references and contracts and that type of thing, but it will be in the near future. But Tom Sargent, to come back to him, uh, was Justice's secretary from 1957 until his retirement in 1982. And as a result of his commitment, persistence and sheer determination, Justice played a key role in taking up the cause of miscarriages of justice, uh, and he tirelessly campaigned uh, in some 25 people, people's cases, uh, ensuring that they were released uh, or released very early from prison. And he was instrumental in many of the cases that some will remember on the BBC Rough Justice series. He also played a major role in bringing about some of the key measures, such as the creation of the Office of Ombudsman uh, and the establishment of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme, uh, two of the really major historic achievements of justice over its existence. So this year's lecture, uh, we're very fortunate to have Sir Geoffrey Voss, Master of the Rolls, uh, who is going to give uh, this lecture on the subject, How Judges Work, a reappraisal for the 21st century. And the lecture will be followed by an opportunity for questions from the audience through the Q&A function that you are now familiar with, I expect, on your screens. You can put your questions um, straight into the box at any stage of the lecture as, as, you, as your thoughts come to mind, uh, but you'll understand that our speaker will only answer those questions after the lecture in the time for, for questions and answers. So a short uh, introduction, introduction to Sir Geoffrey. Um, Sir Geoffrey Voss was called to the bar in 1977. He took silk in 1993 was appointed as a Justice of the High Court assigned to the Chancery Division in October 2009. And between 2005 and 2009, he served as a Judge of the Courts of Appeals of Jersey and Guernsey, and a Judge of the Court of Appeal of the Cayman Islands between 2008 and 2009. He sat as a Deputy High Court Judge from 1999 until 2009. He was Chairman of the Bar Council in 2007, he became president of the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary in January 2015, and he was appointed Chancellor of the High Court of England and Wales with effect from the 24th of October 2016. Most recently, he was appointed as a Lord Justice of Appeal in 2013, and then Master of the Rolls and Head of Civil Justice on the 11th of January this year. We're extremely fortunate that Sir Geoffrey has been a member of Justice since the early 1990s. So please, will you welcome Sir Geoffrey Voss. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Peter. It's great to be here, albeit uh, virtually. Um, I have actually wanted for some time to talk about judging in the 21st century. As many of you will know, judging is seen by many as an unchanging and completely unchanged activity. Now, of course, we no longer conduct murder trials in an hour and send people to the gallows before lunch, as may have happened in the 18th century. But the business of deciding legal issues and hearing evidence has been largely unchanged for many years. And certainly ever since I started studying the law in 1973, which was uh, very nearly 50 years ago. The truth is that the lives of the people that our justice system serves have changed hugely in those 50 years. In 1973, there was no internet, there was no email, there was no social media, no artificial intelligence, no blockchain, and no big data. 
Now we have all those things. And as a result, people's reasonable expectations have changed too. The court-based dispute resolution system that we operate was born in bygone centuries. And despite some attempts at reform before the digital age, such, such as the Wolf reforms, it's still very much steeped in history. In judicial terms, in 1973, we had 18 Court of Appeal judges as opposed to 39. We had 70 High Court judges, now we have 108, and 240 County Court or Circuit judges as opposed to 660 today. But one thing about these judges that is also notable is their diversity. In 1973, the overwhelming majority of the 328 judges at the levels I've described were white men. And now the figures are 27% women and or BAME uh, judges in the Court of Appeal, 32% women and BME in uh, the High Court and 34% women and BME in the circuit or county court. Now this evening, I want to explore the way that judges work and their diversity. And I want to ask what changes could be made to create a justice system fit for the 21st century. Now to achieve this, we need to look at, I think first, what has changed about our society that requires the reappraisal that I'm suggesting? And secondly, what needs to change in our justice system if it is to retain the confidence of our modern population and modern business? Thirdly, what are the ways of working that will be required of judges in order to decide cases within the reformed structures that I envisage? And finally, how the judiciary can truly reflect the society that it serves. So let's start with what's changed about our society that requires a reappraisal. I've already mentioned some of the dramatic technological changes that have occurred in the last 50 years. Some would argue that justice systems provide the consistency and certainty that society needs and that their unchanging nature is therefore a good thing. And to an extent, I agree. It is of fundamental importance to every society that citizens have the ability to vindicate their legal rights against other citizens and against the state before an impartial judge at proportionate cost and without undue delay. These are the underpinnings of the rule of law. I also accept that our justice system is probably more accessible now than it was 50 years ago. It's easier for families to access the courts and for small claims to be brought and for tribunal claims to be made than it probably was back in 1973. But the developments that I've mentioned have also given people greater and different expectations. Rapid communication, has meant that injustices that ordinary members of society would simply have had to swallow in 1973 are now the subject of campaigns on social media and sometimes long-term upset, dissatisfaction, and even psychological trauma. The complexities of our lives in a digital era means that there is more scope for injustice as between citizens and as between citizens and the state than really there ever was before. And these changes have crept up on us, which is why I'm making my comparison with the time when I started to study law. They haven't happened overnight, and there's not been one development that has made it necessary to reevaluate how our justice system works. It's not because the internet is there, and is now pretty well accessible to all, that makes it sensible to put justice online. It's not 
because artificial intelligence is an available tool that means we have to use it to resolve civil claims. It's the combination of all the changes in our society that all these developments taken together have caused that should I think suggest to the thoughtful observer that a re-evaluation of how we resolve disputes is really timely and necessary. I often say that young people in the era of social media expect to get everything instantly on their mobile phones and that they will not for very long continue to accept that justice can only be obtained on paper in a court building miles away after months or years of waiting. This also is only part of the story. In the last 50 years, I've observed a number of fundamental changes in the relationships between citizens and businesses on the one hand, and lawyers, the courts, and judges on the other hand. The paper-based face-to-face system of seeking legal advice and determining disputes in the 1970s was aligned with the way everything else in our society was done. Limited in the main to those who could pay, you went to see your solicitor in the high street and a claim was typed out by a typist and taken down to the local county court, stamped and then served in person or by post before waiting 14 or 28 days for an equally paper-based response. But nobody needs to travel to seek legal advice anymore. Typists hardly exist, and the post is no longer used for everyday communications. A non-digital system is no longer aligned with everything else in society. Banking is now universally online, utility bills are delivered and paid online, shopping is predominantly online, and interaction with government is generally as COVID has demonstrated by apps, email, or online. Business life and business communication has simply changed beyond recognition. We no longer need to sign anything. Electronic signatures are commonplace for tenancy agreements, energy, supply agreements, and commercial documentation. The ubiquitous use of the blockchain and of cryptocurrencies and smart contracts is inexorably heading towards us, even if it has taken longer than some may have expected. Transferable digital documentation will very soon be the norm in transportation, banking, financial services, and across other industrial sectors. Against this background, it's surprising at least that anyone should think it sensible to continue to resolve disputes arising from such digital engagements, whether between citizens, between the state and its citizens, or between commercial entities, by an analog, paper-based, and predominantly face-to-face -face process. So my second question is what needs to change in our justice system if it's going to retain the confidence of our modern population and modern businesses. I say the case for change is powerful. The nature of that change is very much less obvious. Many of the stakeholders in our justice system are keen to preserve their existing ways of working. Lawyers undertaking IPOs are not well disposed towards the idea that their documentation should be digitized and neither created nor checked by armies of youthful and enthusiastic paralegals and assistant solicitors. Indeed, whilst many judges and lawyers have, over the pandemic, become quickly converted to the benefits of remote hearings, fewer are keen to change the underlying process of taking evidence and hearing legal argument viva voce which has been the lifeblood blood of our courts since Sir Edward Cook sat in Westminster Hall as Chief Justice of the King's Bench between 1613 and 1616. Then he sat four times a year in terms that lasted only two weeks each, 
not quite like today. So there's no doubt that many lawyers and judges are content to use electronic methods to do what we used to do on paper without any thirst to change the way disputes are resolved in any more fundamental way. And there are a number of reasons why I believe that is simply not enough. Of course, we can, and in many cases do, use electronic documents in court rather than paper ones. I've been an entirely paper-free judge for two years or more. Of course, we can and do use remote video hearings for many short applications, even now that the pandemic permits us to return to physical courts. And of course, we've introduced electronic filing in many of our senior courts and in the business and property courts. All these forms of electronic working do not, however, shorten the process of determining a dispute. In the civil process, 14 days is still allowed for the filing of an acknowledgement of service and another 14 days for defense. Even small claims can still take six months or a year to resolve. And the dispute resolution process is still not particularly accessible to non-lawyers and ordinary citizens. Some claims can already be brought by litigants in person online, which has been one of the great achievements of the HMCTS reform program, but not yet all claims of whatever complexity. In addition, there's no middle way of determining a dispute that is defended, which is not involved attending a sometimes lengthy oral hearing, either on a video link or in person. And this is an intimidating experience for many and is not always justified by the issues at stake. In my view, we need to reconsider how we resolve disputes, taking all the factors I've mentioned, and I'm sure many more that I have not, into account. So as to create a system that is proportionate in every case, easily accessible to all, timely, and provides repeated integrated opportunities for consensual resolution rather than exacerbation of the dispute. On too many occasions, we see the process itself creating entrenched positions between opposing parties from which each party finds it increasingly difficult to, to retreat. It is noteworthy, anecdotally, how parties seem to become increasingly convinced of the justice of their case every time that case is repeated and elaborated in pleadings, witness statements, experts' reports, and then in written skeleton arguments and eloquent oral arguments. I've spoken extensively about the reforms that I see as being necessary. And I'm not going to prolong tonight's lecture by going into detail about them. It seems though that we need an entirely online justice system for civil family and tribunals. The online space should be accessible to all, whether represented or not. I see the justice system as is well known as a funnel into which all disputes are poured. And there would be three layers, a first layer, comprising a website and associated app, which directs any would-be litigant to the appropriate pre-action portal, whether publicly or privately funded. A second layer comprising a whole range of pre-action portals or ombuds processes, and a third layer comprising online court platforms for money claims, damages claims, possession claims, public and private family claims, employment claims, immigration tribunals, to name but a few. A single data set is created for every case when the proceedings are commenced or at the pre-action stage when the case is brought to a pre-action dispute resolution portal, such as the existing personal injury or whiplash portals. The online programs will suggest to the parties, whether manually or by the use of artificial intelligence, out-of-court solutions, so that the parties have multiple opportunities to reach a compromise. 
directions are given online, evidence where required is done online, and most important of all, the ultimate dispute resolution method will be proportionate to what is at stake. Many cases will be resolved by judges online on the materials available without the need for any hearing at all. And where hearings are required, they'll be remote or face-to-face -face according to the needs of the dispute itself. There will be no automatic requirement that every dispute, however trivial, must be resolved in an old-fashioned, oak-panelled courtroom miles away from the party's homes or offices. For bigger commercial cases, and in some cases with less money at stake, hearings will still be needed. But even then, they should be of proportionate length, broken down into issues, so that the lengthy state trial of business cases lasting weeks or months becomes unusual, becomes a rarity, or even a thing of the past. But most crucially, the online process I'm suggesting will abrogate artificially long time limits, born of the need to use typists and post boxes, and allow people and lawyers to put forward their cases online when it suits them, and without the need for any or at least so many formally drafted documents that are costly and often unnecessary. The true issue between the parties will mostly be identified by the use of sophisticated online decision trees, making particulars of claim, sometimes evasive or even obstructive defenses and lengthy replies, OTS. So I come to my third section. What are the ways of working that will be required of judges in order to decide cases within the kind of reformed structures that I've been talking about. If all this happens, and I should say that what I've described is very much work in progress in the courts of England and Wales, how is it going to affect the working lives of judges? Now, this is a big question because many of the judges of 2021 signed up for a job that involved a working week of sitting in a physical court and deciding cases between real people uh, arraigned in front of them, represented by real life lawyers, again, in front of them. Many present day judges would simply not take kindly to a working week that was undertaken entirely in front of a screen without the court interactions I've mentioned. So how is that circle to be squared? Well, first, I think that judges and their working practices are already changing more than many think. Many judges are actually quite digitally savvy and can see the benefits of an online dispute resolution process. The benefits to the individuals and businesses litigating are palpable. There are concrete examples of cases within the new online civil money claim system that have been resolved in hours or days. I'm afraid it's appalling that in county courts up and down the country, barrows of paper files are still being wheeled around, clogging up the lifts so that a judge can, for example, write on the top of a massive pile of papers that 21 days is to be allowed to the defendant to file an answer to a request for further information about their defence. It is obviously beneficial for such management processes to be done online. Moreover, the misconceptions of a judicial tale should not be allowed to wag the justice system dog. The importance of creating a dispute resolution process that takes account of the technological and societal changes I've mentioned should be the dominant objective. It's a matter of the rule of law. If we were to be providing dispute resolution processes fit only for a bygone era, citizens, businesses, and indeed the state itself would cease to have confidence in it. And the reverse is true. If we grasp the nettle of reform and complete the digitization of the civil, which I include family and tribunals, 
of civil dispute resolution, putting it online in a single process accessible to all, we will be fulfill fulfilling our role of stewardship by insulating justice principles against the challenges of the future and giving our justice system the capability to resolve disputes effectively, efficiently, and at proportionate cost, even once the new technologies such as smart contracts and cryptocurrencies immutably recorded on the blockchain are in use across our lives. It's not our role as judges to set ourselves against the inevitable digitization of society. On the contrary, I think we should embrace it. The inevitability of digitization does also mean, though, that judges must work to understand it better and to identify and set out the value of the essential components of human judicial interaction within that system. And I've mentioned this point before in the context of artificial intelligence, but it's no different really with other technologies. We judges must be careful that the value we bring is not simply the rigid adherence to tradition, but is instead the articulation and careful stewardship of the purpose and value of justice and the justice system. So from that high principle to the practical, I don't think that judicial working lives will actually be as different as some may fear. Yes, directions in online cases will be given online. Papers will be replaced by online decision trees and digital documentation. But in the most complex cases, as I've already said, face-to-face -face hearings, whether remote or in person, will still be needed to resolve complex factual and legal issues. Judges looked at generally and across the board actually spend most of their time resolving substantive and complex questions of fact and law, not administering small claims. And the overwhelming benefit of the smart online pre-action portals and the smart online court systems that HMCTS is already building within the reform program is that they will relieve judges at all levels of a substantial proportion of their current administrative burden. Once an order is made online, the digital system reminds the parties about its requirement by texts, emails, or communications automatically. It's just the same as happens with your online Tesco order when you're texted on multiple occasions to be informed that Kevin in the blue van will arrive at your door shortly and the leaks that you ordered will be trimmed ones rather than the whole leaks that you wanted. If a smart online judge drawn directions order is not complied with, even after, after multiple reminders, the system itself will take the appropriate consequential steps where appropriate. And this operates, as I say, to prevent judges having to do so much administration. It is not, as some seem to think, directed either at saving money or getting them, the judges, to undertake administration that can perfectly well be done by clerks and junior staff, nor does it abrogate our responsibilities to have oversight of that system. Judging then will be a bit different in the future, but then so will, actually so are, everyone's ordinary lives. Judges will spend more time online and more time with documents on screen than with piles of papers. And there may be less lengthy days in court, but ultimately the constant is the resolution of difficult legal and factual issues between real people and real businesses. The critical feature of judges and judging is that these real people and real businesses have confidence in the system. We've been fortunate that the justice system of England and Wales has always achieved that confidence. And there is no reason why anything I've said 
should impair it. Judging will continue to be based on the complete integrity of our judiciary and the pursuit of the just solution to legal problems based on the law and evidence in each case. <coughs> And as I always say, the lawyers will not be made redundant by what I'm describing. And rather, they will be as much, if not more, in demand than ever, advising on difficult issues and representing their clients in contested cases. Remember, the complexity of the issues increases every day. The bulk of cases may be resolved online quickly and without lawyers involvement, but that will have huge economic benefits in terms of early payment and reduction of the psychological stresses caused by the effect of lengthy litigation processes. Lawyers will continue to be engaged wherever they can add value. They will still be needed by clients in all types of claims, <coughs> and where a claim can be satisfactorily resolved, at the pre-action portal stage or when brought online by continuous mediated interventions, it is surely better that they should be. So I come to the final section. How can the judiciary truly reflect the society that it serves? In the world as I see it, we have a digital online justice system governed by online rules that will streamline the dispute resolution process <coughs> me, and promote early compromise. In my view, the creation of a digital justice system is highly relevant to improvements in the diversity of the judiciary. Digital working introduces flexibility into a judge's working life. Much of the preparation and case management and indeed case preparation can be done online at any time of the day or indeed the night. This allows women and judges from different communities to work whenever suits them, rather than exclusively during what we now regard as normal court hours. In addition, as more and more cases are resolved without lengthy face-to-face -face court hearings, the process becomes more acceptable and intuitive to a younger generation and more diverse lawyers. <coughs> At the moment, becoming a judge, particularly a senior judge, is perhaps most attractive to a cohort of small c conservative lawyers who are often disproportionately white and male. The paraphernalia of judging, specifically the contentious process of the courtroom, is hardwired into that section of our legal community. But once we put the process online in the way I've described, I can see women lawyers and lawyers from all communities being more attracted to the flexibility of online judicial working. Some have said that judicial diversity will look after itself as more women and people from diverse backgrounds enter the legal profession. I'm worried this is not the case. We don't need the precise figures this evening, but it is clear that in gender terms, about 50% of people entering the bar and solicitors profession have been women for years now. And yet 50% of QCs and senior lawyers are not women, very far from it. The pool of those who could join the senior judiciary is not therefore as diverse as it needs to be to ensure a diverse judiciary in the future. I said in a speech to the Chancery Bar Association back in January 2019, that this was because achieving real success in a litigation practice required our lawyers at all levels to dedicate so much of their time to their professional activities that there was inadequate time for a proper life. Many people were simply not willing to countenance the levels of commitment required to sustain a successful practice. The sheer number of hours worked and the requirement to be available 24 seven and at weekends, together with the demands of lengthy oral hearings, placed huge strains on advocates 
and instructing lawyers alike. It was often necessary for those involved in synchronous court hearings to stay up much of the night to prepare cross-examination and speeches for the court. And all these pressures took their toll on those with family and other commitments that were entitled to some priority in themselves. The speech was not universally well received, but remains valid even after the lessons we've learned from the COVID pandemic. I explained then that we could hope for a win-win outcome by designing a new system for a new era with the essential requirements of justice and the diversity of the judiciary in mind. A litigation system could be created that did not make so many of the demands that the present system imposes on its lawyer participants. Much of the preparation could take place asynchronously with lawyers logging on and working at times of day that suited them, with judges making orders online, and the lawyers and parties fulfilling their obligations to the court with shorter deadlines, but outside the confines of a formal hearing. There would be, in that situation, I said, a real likelihood that the composition of the pool from which judges are chosen, particularly senior judges, would come, cl come closer to its natural and representative diversity. So let me try, <coughs> excuse me, and draw a few conclusions. I believe that the reforms I've mentioned will have a number of advantages. First, an online justice system will undoubtedly increase access to justice. The vulnerable and the digitally disadvantaged will be assisted to ensure that everyone can use it effectively. Secondly, it will streamline justice and reduce the cost to litigants, whether they're consumers, tenants, businesses, families, or employees. Thirdly, it will improve the working lives of judges, allowing them to focus on what really matters, to concentrate on the cases that raise difficult issues of fact and law, leaving the smart systems to undertake the routine processes that currently reflect themselves in masses of box work carted round the courts on overflowing trolleys. I believe that once judges understand how the online space can improve their working lives, the judiciary will begin to attract as salaried judges, whether full-time or salaried part-time working, more women lawyers, more lawyers from a diversity of different backgrounds. Working online allows for more family and carer-friendly working patterns for judges and lawyers alike, and salaried judges will be freed up to concentrate on the important contested cases that require their attention. The changes I'm talking about will probably come quicker and be more radical than any of us can imagine. But judges in 2021 should be receptive to change. They should be driving change. Judges should be trying to ensure that with a radical revision of the way we provide justice for every single member of our society, we do not lose our grip on the fundamental principles. The need for independent and accountable judges and justice systems to deliver fair and transparent, affordable, and most of all, timely justice for all our citizens. Thank you. So, Geoffrey, thank you very much for that uh, timely uh, speech. I need to uh, then thank all the audience as well for attending. We've had well over 160 people attending this lecture. That's a fantastic number um, to uh, be attending. Uh, so thank you all for your um, support of justice by uh, coming tonight. Um, please do remember justice. If you're not a member of justice, please do find out from our website about uh, joining us. Uh, these are critical times for the justice system and for the rule of law, not just in, in the UK, but uh, of course around the world, uh, as, uh, as, as you can see from uh, the events that are taking place. Uh, there's no, never really been a, a, a better time to join justice and to support the need for a strong and independent and innovative voice uh, from the profession on how the system 
should and could work differently. We've broken mem uh, rem membership records this year. We now exceed 2000 members. Uh, and that means that we've got the highest number of members in the history of justice. And it's growing all the time with support from the people who are here tonight and from others. Uh, but we still need your support. There are plenty of things that we want to do uh, that we can only do with the resources to achieve them. And that uh, includes having uh, the money to pay for uh, the best uh, lawyers to work on the subjects that we uh, are seeing as being important to uh, the future of, uh, of the law in this country uh, and around the world. So please do support justice, do join us and do come and find out more about us. But thank you very much, all of you, for attending tonight. Uh, and thank you again, Sir Geoffrey, uh, for a, a marvellous lecture. Uh, and please, perhaps, if you wouldn't mind uh, virtually or, uh, or, or literally uh, giving a round of applause to Sir Geoffrey for his lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.